Good morning. I want to move forward in the service, but I just can't get past the word Christmify. Christmify. I believe that means decorate. I believe that was the word, that's the word he was looking for. Although I actually, actually now prefer Christmify. So, honey, this week we're going to Christmify the house, right? Yeah. Hopefully. Welcome. I was out last week, uh, as many of you know. I missed you. Uh, you've told me that you missed me. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I, part of my heart is always here when I'm, when I'm away, uh, but I also rest well knowing that, that the elders, Andre and Billy and Michael, care well for you. Uh, Andre in particular I want to thank as he preached in my absence this past weekend. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, if, you're not a, if you're not a preaching pastor, you maybe don't know the, the weight and the burden of trying to be out of town and wanting to have someone come up here and rightly divide God's word. So it's a, it's, a, it's a blessing and a privilege to have other good men who serve you and serve me well in that capacity. So again, thank you. And, and, and several, several other people here today, I won't, I won't name them, but, but cover when I'm gone. So thank you to all of you that, that helped out last week. And it's good, good to be back together with you today. In one week, we are starting a new series it's titled A Thrill of Hope. This is our Advent season series. Maybe you want to call it Christmas. That's fine. Christmas officially is on December 25th, but the four Sundays leading up to Christmas, the church has historically, traditionally called that the Advent season, in which we prepare for such a high and holy day as Christmas. And so that's what we'll be doing during the month of December for four, for four Sundays. I'll be preaching on Advent Christmas themes. Um, if, you, uh, if you purchased uh, the Advent book, mo- most of us did, you'll have that in your home so you can crawl through that uh, with your friends or if you have a family, crawl through that with your, your spouse and your kids. Each day there's a reading. It's an opportunity for you to come together as a family, for you to come together uh, as a community and, and, and prepare uh, during this season. I want you to know this. Um, the Advent book that you now have in your home, those of you that have already picked it up, and, I'll, and the four sermons that I'll be preaching on Sunday, on the four Sundays of Advent, they'll, they're loosely connected, but they're not completely connected. And the reason I want you to know that is you as a family need to really dig through that book, crawl through that, that resource, and get everything out of it that you can. I'm going to help you with that. I'm going to give you some tips and some ideas next week. But, but you glean as much as you can on your own time, doing your own work. There's a lot of scripture in that book. There are a lot of good ideas as to how you, as, a, as, as friends, you as a family, can, uh, can really make the most of this season. So, so, so I, look forward to, I look forward to this series, A Thrill of Hope, and we will begin that next week, which leads us to the next fact, and that is today is the, the final installment of this four-week mini-series that I've been preaching through. If you're new here uh, at River Church, typically what we do is, uh, typically, we preach through books of the Bible. For, on occasion, we'll, we will pick up a topic, like the topic of prayer, and then I, we will preach topically for a season, and then we'll go back into another book of the Bible. So we, we, uh, we, we honor uh, and esteem the, 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 the technique of preaching through books of the Bible. We honor and esteem the technique of preaching through topics as long as they are in the Bible and we are actually preaching God's Word accurately. So anyway, this is the last week in which we're talking about prayer. I'm going to remind you of something that I said even prior to us beginning this series. Uh, I said, I, I want us to devote on this topic of prayer for the next four weeks because I'm really, I'm really convinced that, that most of us carry a high level of guilt regarding the prayerlessness in our lives. Maybe it's a silent guilt. You don't admit it to one another. But, but many of us carry a high level, level of guilt regarding the, 
the prayerlessness in our lives. And, and the second uh, thing that I really, really believe is it, many of us are largely, uh, this is kind of, a, kind of a hard word, but largely ignorant of what prayer is and how we can really engage in prayer for lengthy seasons of time. I feel like I've only scratched the surface on this in the last four weeks, but if nothing else, hopefully it's stirred within you a fire, a passion to be a more fervent prayer. And it is to that end that I preach this final sermon today. So November is, is, is almost gone. It feels like it just got here, uh, and yet it's almost gone. And so I want to start by asking you a question. When I mention the month of November, what is the first thing that comes to mind for most of us? Now, before you answer, let's say it's July and I say the month of November. I bring it up in a conversation or, or it's February and I bring up the month of November as a topic. What is the first thing that comes to mind? Football. We're just going to go with Thanksgiving, okay? That's where we're going to go with. <clears throat> That's what you're supposed to say. All right. Football. Yeah, there you go. Man after my own heart. Um, yeah, so, so I, I, I think if I took a poll, probably way up on the list would be uh, Thanksgiving. When we, when we mention, when I mention November, in the, in the middle of summer, we probably, we tend to think. But what I want you to know today is that for me, there's, there's something very different that, that comes to mind. I actually think, I don't know where this came from, but I think somebody actually said my answer. For me, I have a different answer. When I think of the month of November, what comes to my mind is birthdays. I think someone actually said that. Birthdays, and I'll tell you why. Because in the month of November, the Caulfields, my immediate family, but then also Lydia's side of the extended family, we just have lots and lots of birthdays, many birthdays in the month of November. Lydia and I just did a quick count the other night, and I think we came up with like nine different names of people in our, in a fairly small, uh, well, in, in, in our family, that, like nine people that have a uh, birthday in the month of November. My two youngest boys, uh, Nolan and Boyce, uh, they, had them, they had birthdays in the month of November. Um, Lydia's birthday is today. Uh, happy birthday, sweetheart. So, yeah, yeah. My beloved, my beloved uh, uh, mother-in-law, Mary Ann Horn, who, uh, who's in uh, Nebraska. She had surgery this week. She's doing well. R road to recovery ahead. But, but her birthday is in November. Uh, we have other uh, nieces and nephews and an uncle. And we've about nine people. So when I think of November, yeah, it brings the, the, an un un unusually large number of birthdays in my family. Hard evidence of how seriously we take Valentine's Day, I, I, I suppose. <laughs> Some of you will get that joke later. Um, but November traditionally is known as the, the month of, of Thanksgiving. And so today, as we finish this series, I thought it good and right for us to think deeply on the issue of thankfulness on the issue of gratitude. I, I, don't, I don't know if this is true of you, but I have a longing in my heart to be known as a person where thankfulness flows freely from my heart. I, I, I long for God to know me as that type of child, one whose heart stirs with gratitude. I have a desire that my kids would one day say that of me. Probably wouldn't say that of me today, but they would one day say that, that Dad was a thankful dad. He was, his heart was filled with gratitude. Last night, I was, I was bouncing around the house, and I had this, like, uh, I had this spike, this spike of gratitude. If you would have come to my house last night, you might have mistakenly thought, well, maybe Randy had a little too much to drink. And it wasn't that at all. I was just, I was, I was, 
I was filled with, with joy and, and happiness. My, my daughter had uh, Alyssa's home. My daughter had just arrived home, and, and some things that I've, have been kind of uh, concerning me kind of came together, and, 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 and there was this spike of gratitude, and I thought, oh, that life might always be like this, that my heart might, rather than it be a spike, rather than it be an anomaly, that, that I might be a person of gratitude all the time. The truth is, my circumstances really hadn't changed much at all last night. Uh, my, my, my kids are, are healthy, but my kids have been healthy. But last night, there was this spike of gratitude. I, 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 I have a job, but, but I've had a job. Nothing changed last night for me circumstantially, for the most part. So while my circumstances have really been, or really are what they have been, and there has not been that much of a change, in my heart last night there was a significant change. And I, I've pondered, I thought, why is that? What if I could bottle that? What if I could actually see that um, born out of my life over a long period of time? Heart of gratitude. So when thankfulness flows freely, flows freely from my heart, flows freely from my lips, that's what I want. Don't, don't you want that? Oh, how I want that. The great theologian and uh, American rock and roll singer Sheryl Crow uh, used to sing, used to sing, uh, let's see if I can get this right, it's not, it's not getting what you want, it's wanting what you have. And again, with, with, with few exceptions in this room, and there are some exceptions, but with few exceptions in this room, most of us here have so much to be thankful for, so much to be grateful for. There is a depth and a breadth to our lives that, 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 that really affords us great opportunity for gratitude. And, and yet, and I ask myself this, why is it that my gratitude is oft short, so short-lived? A thankful heart is like like medicine. The gratitude in your heart actually is like medicine. It actually will impact you, your health, your, your longevity, your, your family life. And it's most honoring to God. So that's what we're talking about today. And we're going we're gonna to look at five most thankful characters, people, in the Bible. And we're going to learn from them today. Five characters. I'm going to give you a fly overview. If you haven't heard of them before, some of them, uh, that, well, they're all in the Bible. So if, if one or two of these characters you haven't heard before, go home and, and, and look them up in the Bible this afternoon and read more about them. The first character is Hannah. Hannah. Let me remind you of Hannah's story. Hannah, uh, in the book uh, of 1 Samuel, um, Hannah was married to Elkanah, her husband. And Hannah longed for, deeply desired to have a child. But she was barren. She she longed and she prayed and she wept and yet she continued to, to not have children. She would go to the temple, which was a trek, it was a, it was a journey. She would go to the temple with her husband once a year. And she was known in the temple as the one who appeared to be inebriated. Now, in reality, the Bible tells us she was not inebriated, but she was so overcome with, with grief and so overcome with the emotion of, of wanting and praying for a child. Some of you know that struggle full well. She was, she was so overcome that, that it appeared to people, including the head priest Eli, the old man Eli, it appeared to people that she was drunk 
because she was so beside herself. She was so overcome with emotion. There's one instance in the story where her husband, now I want to caution you, we're going to read this. Gentlemen, husbands here, when your wife has a deep longing, the deep sorrow, this is not the way to respond. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more than ten sons? If your wife is ever struggling with a deep longing, a a significant desire in her heart, never say, what's wrong with you? Am I not enough? But that's what Elkanah, that's how Elkanah responded to, to, uh, to Hannah that day. So Hannah continued to go year after year to the, to the temple. And she would pray and, and Eli would ask her if she was drunk and she would say, no, she's not. She's just overcome with emotion. And, and one day uh, in the story, uh, she, she makes this most unique vow, vow, V-O-W, a promise to God. Um, it, it, it's it's kind of weird by our standards and, 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 and culturally for us. But, but she says, she makes a promise to God. God, if you will give me a son, I will give him back to you. Now, if we've read the story, you know that the son that she was speaking of was, was, it was Samuel, a great man, a great, a great man, a great leader uh, of, the, of the Israelites in, in the book of 1 Samuel. So the whole book is about, about Samuel, and, and, and it starts with the story of his barren mother, who says, God, if you give me a son, I vow, I promise, I will give him back to you. And, this is, this is most odd, unless you understand the cultural context, and no razor, uh, or we could say scissors, no razor shall ever touch his head. His, his hair will always grow. What's she talking about? She's talking about a religious vow that they would make. She's talking about, God, I will send him back to the temple once he is weaned, once he can eat, eat his own food, and he can, then I will send him to the temple, God, and he will serve you like a vocational minister. He will serve you um, for all of his life. It, it kind of reminds me of... Uh, you, you probably know, I know some, some missionaries, including my, my own uh, mother-in-law, who uh, back in the day, before homeschooling was really a thing, they would go to the mission field. Their children would need to be, uh, to be educated, and so they would send them to boarding school. They're already in a foreign country. Now, they're hundred or hundreds of miles away from their mama. Imagine, as a mama or a daddy, the weight of the burden of that, right? Well, this is, this is like even way bigger than that. And, and so Hannah says, God, if you will, if you will give me a child, I, I, so long, I so long for a child. If you give me a child, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give him right back to you. I, that, that doesn't even really make sense to me. So Hannah was speaking in her heart. Anna, Hannah was speaking in her heart. Uh, only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli, this is the elderly priest, who's really on his way out. He will soon, he will soon no longer be the priest. Uh, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? I'm reading into this a bit, but I just wonder if maybe he'd seen her there enough times like that that he, he's like, content, one, again, the drunk, the drunk lady again, and he says, put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. And the story continues, as I've said. She makes this vow, and then she goes home that year. Except that year was different. That year, she did become, she did become pregnant. And she gave birth to this, this little boy that she'd waited for for so long. And his, she named him Samuel. 
And, and Elkanah, her husband, said, okay, it's time to go to the temple again. And she said, not this year. She wasn't holding out on God. She, she was making good on the promise. She said, I'm not going to go this year. I'm going to wait until little Samuel is actually weaned. He's actually able to eat his own food and, you know, take care of some of his own personal needs. And, and then, then I will go. And I will turn him over, put him in, char- in, in the charge uh, or, or of, of Eli. And she actually did that. We're not going to read the whole story, but she did that. A few years later, I don't know, we can speculate, three years, four years later, she took little boy Samuel to the, to the temple steps and she left him there for good. And you can imagine how that would break your heart. How you might become embittered. You might second guess yourself. But on that day, she, she turned him over to Eli and, and it says, and Eli, I suppose because of just the, 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 the overwhelming nature of, being, uh, of her faithfulness. It says that Eli, he bowed and worshipped that day. But what I want you to see really though is, is on that day, on the day that she turned Samuel over to the temple, on that day, here is, what, here is what her worship looked like. On the day when she took her little, her toddler boy to the temple. It says, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. The word of the Lord. And when does this come out of her mouth? Immediately after she had made good on her promise to leave her son at the temple to serve the Lord. As I said, we're going to look at five lessons from thankful people today in the Bible. But the weird thing is, these thankful people, they're not like what we think of when we think of thankful people. This is the first lesson that we learn. We learn it from Hannah's life. And that is that thankful prayers... They often flow out of difficult times of sacrifice. Making sacrifices for your kids. Making sacrifices for a friend. Making a sacrifice for the Lord. Her thankfulness, Hannah's thankfulness, it it flowed out of her willingness to give something up. That's not where I look. Uh, that's not where I go looking when I, when I look for the source of my thankfulness, for the source of my gratitude. What could I give up that I might be more thankful as a person? What might I sacrifice so that my, my gratitude meter might, might, might really tip the scales? Something she had always wanted, a boy, and now she gives him up. She gives him over to the Lord. And in that she finds a heart of gratitude. She finds deep satisfaction. It's like saying, oh, 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 that I have something to sacrifice, oh Lord. Oh, that you've given me a resource that I might now give it back to you. There are people, even in the context of, of, of our small church, people who have, who, have, who have taken from their resources. God has given them resources, finances, money, and they have given generously back to the Lord. And in some cases, months pass and, or, or years pass, and, and later on, they, that person finds themselves being actually blessed by the church, sometimes even financially, in a new season, a time of of need. We don't often think of, 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 of gratitude and thankfulness like this. I think of a parent who, who sends her son off to the mission field and in that sacrifice finds deep gratitude. Some of you today, you're, you're, you're in the process of letting something go. 
some of you today in this room, you're in the process of, of giving something over to the Lord, giving someone over to the Lord. And, and, and the first thing that we, we learn today about gratitude, about thankfulness, is that, that thankful prayers often flow out of some really serious times of sacrifice. The second character we're going to look at today is King David. You know, before he was a king, he was a shepherd boy. He was, we know him to be uh, uh, a, a, an excellent marksman with his slingshot. We know him to be the, the young man who slayed Goliath. We also know, know date King David uh, before he was king. Uh, we know him to be a, an excellent musician and poet. Um, he was the poet who wrote much of the, the entire book of, of Psalms, which historically for the church, it's been our song book. He was a man of praise. If he, was, if he was attending River Church, he would probably be up on the stage leading us in worship. And then he'd probably be preaching and he'd probably be protecting us and he'd probably be running, running a, an awesome business. He was just a crazy, awesome guy. We know him to be the king who danced before the Lord. Not a disrespectful way, not in a... In a, in a way that was deeply worshipful. As, as the king of Israel, he danced before the Lord and, and it embarrassed his wife. But he said, my, my, my love, my affection, my devotion is to the Lord. I will, I will dance before the Lord. I will, I will uh, humble myself before the Lord. But we also know that he was a man who went through some really dark days. You know the Bathsheba story. Um, he, was, he was the king of Israel. He was a poet. He was a musician. He was a warrior. He was a man after God's own heart. And yet he went through darker days than, than most of us men have ever gone through. Uh, as king, he, uh, he, 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 he looked on uh, a lady uh, with lust, and, and she was married to a simple man, uh, a man in the military, a man who didn't have much, but he had a beautiful wife. And King David decided to take even that from him. The one thing that this lowly poor man had. He took his wife. He killed, he killed Bathsheba's husband. He brought Bathsheba into uh, his own harem. And, um, and, then he, uh, and then she was with child, with King David's child. And the long and short of it is he, um, he went through the darkest days of his life. God judged him. Um, he knew that most likely this infant child was going to die, but he fell on his knees and he prayed for a lengthy season that God would restore, that God would allow this infant child that had been born out of this terrible sin, and it wasn't the baby's fault, oh Lord, would you let this baby live? And then the baby died. And what we would expect is that King David would, have, would, would, would spend at least a few days of just cursing the Lord. Or cursing himself. <clears throat> saying, I, I did this to myself. I, I deserve this. But, but oddly, uh, oddly, what David actually does is he worships the Lord. <clears throat> After the baby had died, no one wanted to tell the King David because he had been so distraught over the child's uh, physical condition. No one wanted to be the bearer of bad news. So when David saw that his servants were whispering together, <clears throat> David understood that the child was dead. And David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is in fact dead. Yeah. 
Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes and he went into the house of the Lord and he worshipped. Lesson we learn from, from King David's life is this. Thankful prayers often flow out of deep loss. I've seen it many times, folks. I've seen men and women who are <clears throat> who are for a season far from the Lord. <clears throat> I've seen I've seen it where men and women who 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 are for a season their heart is cold and and callous to the things of the Lord. Their their affections are stirred by this world and the stuff of earth. But their affections are not stirred by the things of the Lord, by the kingdom of God. And then, and then they go through a deep loss. And I don't, I don't want that for anyone. But they go through a deep loss. And what's gained from that, what's gained from deep loss, friends, is a, is a sovereign confidence that God wastes no pain. God doesn't waste even a drop of pain. He uses it all for your good. He uses it all for His glory. He is caring. He is, he is caring all the time. He is, he is good. He is good all the time. There is nothing random or haphazard about the ways of the Lord. And so when David rises from his knees and realizes... <clears throat> In deep sorrow and mourning that his, his, his baby is now dead, he has this sovereign, he has this God confidence that this too will not be wasted. That this too somehow will be for good. Some of you here today <clears throat> are going through loss. Some of you here today, you, you, like King David, like maybe a year of your life has been lost. Think on that. A year of, a, a year, this had to have been, like after a year, a year of sorrow and judgment and, and embarrassment and public shame on the part of King David, after a year, then his baby dies. And he thinks probably to himself, or he could have, what a waste of a year. Some of you have have lost years in sorrow, lost years in, in embarrassment and shame. Some of you have, been, have lost years in incarceration. And what I want you to learn from King David today is that thankful prayers, doesn't seem like they should, but thankful prayers oft flow out of deep loss. There's a third character that we look at, and that is Mary, the the mother of Jesus. Mary. We caricature her story. We, uh, we, <clears throat> we hallmark channel her story. And we make it out to be, and ultimately it is, but we make it out to be a, a sweet, neat story, which it's really not. It's complex. It's rough. Mary was born in, in, in brutal days where, where, where women were not, were not esteemed. They were not, not really well treated. And, and Mary, Mary was born uh, into a, a rough vi fishing village known as Nazareth. And really her only hope, her only hope would to be, to be married to a kind and loving man who, who would care for her. Or I suppose she could stay at home and, and serve her parents for the rest of her life. But in the brutal age into which she was born, there wasn't much other hope than that. And so you can imagine for a young teenage gal when she is, when she is betrothed, which means that she was engaged, which means that she, there was a, it was a, it was a prearranged marriage. When she finds out that, that Joseph, the carpenter in town, will one day be her husband. You can imagine the joy. You can imagine the, the delight and, 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 and the wonder and the, 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 the forward-thinking sort of excitement that she has. 
until one day, until one day an angel shows up and tells her, um, you have a baby inside of you and it's the Son of God. And her life must have come apart. Her only hope was this marriage to Joseph. A good man with a good job, and he, he was a good man. He's one of my favorite characters, Joseph, the adoptive father of Jesus. He's one of my favorite characters in the Bible. But, but she must have thought, this, this good man, this, this, this carpenter, a man with a good job, he, my only way out. He will slur my name. He can rightfully, legally have me killed. Because I am pregnant, no one knows who the father is. But we know it's not Joseph, and I'm betrothed to him. So what must her, what, what, what must the, the, the complexity of the emotions of, of that? We, we, cannot fully, uh, we cannot fully grasp because we, are, uh, we live in a different context. We live in a different culture, but, but we can at least at least imagine to some degree the depth of the devastating emotions of that time. And yet here's, here, here are the emotions that we, uh, here are the emotions that we, we get a picture of. This is the, uh, historically in the Catholic Mass, this is called the Magnificat. It's, uh, it's the Song of Mary. It says, my soul magnifies the Lord. She just found out she's with child. She might have been 15 years old. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold... For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Oh, what truly prophetic words she spoke. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. What we learn from Mary is that thankful prayers they flow out of difficult a difficult task ahead of you. It may not be sorrowful. It, it may not be a loss. It, it, it may not be anything bad. It may just be something God is calling you to today and only you know. And it's going to be difficult. It's, it's going to be a challenge. Like planting a church. A task ahead of you that's difficult. A, a calling in life that you've just now begun to realize that God is calling me to something that I did not... It couldn't have come from my own brain because it's too crazy. It's too great. It's too awesome. A calling in your life. A, maybe it's just this, this new sense of life's deepest purposes for you. Maybe, maybe you've been trifling at life and you haven't taken God seriously, but now, now something's happened in the last few months and, and now, now life's deepest purposes for you have been unveiled by God. And, and what I want you to know is that gratitude in the Bible, it oft flows out of a difficult task ahead. Something God is calling you today, calling you to today. The fourth character that we look at is the healed leper. Not leopard like the cat, but leper. We don't really, we don't really use that word much, but, but when the Bible describes uh, or, or identifies lepers, these are people who had terrible skin diseases that we don't really fully understand now. We're not exactly sure what they are. People speculated about what 
exactly these skin diseases were, but, but, but if you had leprosy, and there's something today that people call leprosy, it may or may not be the exact same thing, but, but in that day, if you've read your Bible, you've, you've read some of these stories where people with leprosy, they were ostracized. People with, with, with leprosy, they were interned. They were put in a camp. It was such a dangerous disease that they were the outcasts. Like, we love you, but you've got to go away because this could be devastating for us if you stay around. Like, it could wipe out the village. And so they had these camps, internment camps, for, for people that, that, had, um, that had leprosy. People, they had these, these villages where only they could live, and they had to identify themselves from a distance as having leprosy. It, was, it just rocked your world. It changed everything. It was, uh, in addition, it was, it was a, a deeply uh, sort of embarrassing sort of disease to have. And so one day, ten lepers um, showed up. Well, actually, Jesus showed up at a village on, on, his, on one of his walkabouts. He did a lot, of, a lot of those. And he came to a village one day, and ten lepers, who must have been close confidants because they couldn't, they couldn't confide in anyone else, these ten lepers, they show up and like, Jesus, have mercy on us. Heal us, please. And in that day, Jesus healed all ten of the lepers. And what happened was all ten of the lepers left because he told them to go see the priest. And then one of the ten turned around and came back and thanked the Lord, thanked Jesus. I'm going to sneeze, I think. You feel it, don't you? Okay, I think I, I think I kept it in. I thought I was going to sneeze. Um, so, so one of the ten uh, comes back, and this is the uh, this is this is the recording we have. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. That's a whole other level of complexity that we won't get into today. Jesus, as a Jewish man, was not so scandalous that he would, he would touch or hug have anything to do with a Samaritan. So, so, he, so this one was a Samaritan. And then Jesus, Jesus answered or said to him, were not ten men cleansed? Did I not heal ten men? Of course, he knows the answer. Hypothetical. Uh, were not ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Um, was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? He's a Samaritan. And Jesus said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. And I believe that Jesus is speaking of a different type of wellness here. Ten men were healed physically. One man came back with a deep heart of gratitude. And what does he receive? A different sort of wellness. A different type of healing. A heart of gratitude is like medicine to the soul. What do we learn from this guy? Among other things, we learn this. This like, like really cuts deeply for me. Thank, thankful prayers don't come naturally. Blessing is easy to miss. We can be so quick to judge and be like, how dare they? God, Jesus healed them of leprosy and they only 10% only even came back and gave him glory. But I want you to know, if you're waiting until you feel like it, you probably already missed your chance to be a grateful person. It, it, it doesn't come naturally. If we're waiting to feel it, I'll be thankful when I feel like it. You're going to miss out. I'm going to wait till it just, it just flows. It just, it just happens. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to fake it. I don't want to, oh, this, this, this one out of ten, this, this, this dude, he's like, 
I'm healed. Like, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut against the grain. Everybody else is going that way. I'm going to go this way. Right? This is, what, this, is the, this is the natural flow of things, but I'm going to go back. Have you ever been helped by another guy, another dude, another fella, and you don't know him, and then you leave, and you, you just kind of forget about it? It's like, well, I guess I deserved that. Right? Because thankful prayers, hearts of gratitude, they just don't come naturally. Finally, um, the last character, I go back to Jesus. Jesus was known as Jesus was known as a man of sorrows, well acquainted with grief. That's Isaiah. Jesus was a man of sorrows, well acquainted with grief. Yet he often offered up deep prayers of thanksgiving. Few people have gone through the trauma and the stress. Let me let me say that. Let me let me let me, let me say that sentence uh, over. No one has gone through. No human being has gone through the trauma and stress that Jesus went through. I can say that with complete confidence. I can say that with complete authority. Why can I say that? Because Jesus said to the God of the universe, His heavenly Father, My God. My God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was a man of sorrows, well acquainted with grief. And yet he often and regularly offered up deep prayers of thanksgiving. When he gives us model prayers, when he prays over food that will, that will soon feed 5,000 people, his prayers that he modeled often for his disciples and for us, they were, they, they were prayers of thanksgiving. The, the last lesson that I think we learn is this. Thankful prayers flow out of tension in turmoil, in conflict. Why, why do I say that? What do I mean by that? Here's the big lesson today as we, as we prepare to, to head to the table of communion where we, where we meet Jesus once again. The big lesson here today is this. Many of us, we are waiting for everything to get fixed. For everything to go perfectly well before we give thanks. Thankfulness in the Bible looks nothing like that. In the Bible, thankfulness flows out of tension and it flows out of conflict and it, it flows out of loss and it, it flows out of difficult tasks ahead of you. Thankfulness flows even in the midst of sacrifices that God actually calls you to make. Thankfulness in the Bible, hearts of gratitude, flow out of all that tension. Oh, let us be a thankful people. Would you pray with me?